If you go any place where it's cold enough, or high enough, you're likely to encounter one of these. A massive wall of ice. This is called a glacier. Glaciers provide fresh water to many communities on our planet. Around the world, people depend upon glaciers as a source of fresh water. Nearly a third of the world's population lives in areas influenced by glacial meltwater. Glaciers are an essential feature of planet Earth's surface processes and hydrology. Most of the fresh water on Earth is stored in glaciers, so they're significant to the human race. Generally speaking, there are two kinds of glaciers, alpine glaciers and ice sheets. Alpine glaciers are those found in steep mountain valleys, where the average temperature is low enough to maintain ice year-round. A few of the places where you can find alpine glaciers include China, India, and Nepal, Pakistan, Iran, Switzerland, and Peru. If you head to a polar region, specifically Greenland or Antarctica, you'll find ice sheets. Compared to alpine glaciers, ice sheets are very, very large. They represent 99% of glacier ice on Earth, while alpine glaciers make up just 1%. For the purposes of this video, we'll focus only on alpine glaciers. Before we go on, let's establish our goal for this video. After watching this video, you should be able to describe the structure and behaviors of an alpine glacier. First, let's go find some glaciers and see what they look like from the air. To find a glacier, all we have to do is jump onto Google Earth or another map surfing website and go to any mountainous place where it's cold enough. You'll spot glaciers pretty quickly. With even a cursory look at an aerial view of an alpine glacier, it's easy to notice things and wonder things. Watch these aerial views of alpine glaciers and see if you can come up with anything that you notice or wonder. One thing that you might notice right away is that these alpine glaciers look like they're sort of flowing downhill. It seems that the most basic way to describe the behavior of glaciers is to say that they are flowing, and this suggests that under the right conditions, solid ice and snow are able to flow. As a consequence, it means that glaciers move. In this video, we will create our own glacier models to explore how they move and behave. It's pretty much impossible to simulate glaciers in the lab with real ice. They're just too big. But we can replace the ice with something else that flows slowly, just like glaciers do. It would have to be kind of solid, like packed snow, but it would have to be malleable enough to flow downhill. It must be what we would call a plastic solid. Flubber is a convenient material to use in this situation. The reason flubber makes such a good glacier material is that it flows easily, but it's also rigid enough that it doesn't really act like a liquid. There's a few easy recipes out there for flubber, but the best ones include white construction glue and borax powder. See the link in the information section of this video for a simple recipe for glacier flubber. In this video, we are focusing on alpine glaciers, so in order to mimic a steep mountain valley where alpine glaciers are found, we're going to use an inclined PVC pipe that has been split in half. There's our valley, and there's our flubber glacier. What we have set up in this situation is our control settings. We have a specific angle, a specific mass of flubber, and a specific surface texture. We'll see our control settings appear several times, so we can compare them to various experimental settings. 
All of the following observations will be conducted in time-lapse, which means that the speed of the video has been accelerated. First, let's establish a baseline for how our Flubber Alpine Glacier behaves when it flows down a mountain valley. As you watch the following clips, carefully observe how the glacier moves. How would you describe its movement? Do different parts move differently? Can you identify any factors or forces that might influence how it moves? Watch carefully. After watching the footage of the glacier flubber, what behaviors did you observe? Take a moment to summarize how an alpine glacier moves. Now it's time to run a few experiments. In an experiment, usually we compare a set of control conditions to a set of different conditions. In each experiment, only one variable has been adjusted, so we can isolate the effect of that variable. In this first experiment, we'll explore the effect of surface texture on the movement of the glacier. The control conditions are on the left, and the experimental conditions, a rougher, high friction surface, is on the right. In our next experiment, let's see how the slope, or angle, of the mountain valley affects the glacier. Here we have the control slope on the left, and a steeper experimental slope on the right. In the next experiment, let's see what a lubricant does to the glacier's movement. Now we're not likely to find any WD-40 coating the surface of an alpine valley, but we certainly might find water. And like any other lubricant, water can reduce the friction between moving objects. And just as a fun bonus, let's observe what happens when an alpine glacier flows out of a steep valley onto a flat plain. This is called a Piedmont glacier. And also just for fun, here's an ice sheet spreading out in all directions upon a flat surface. Remember, these are found only in Greenland and Antarctica. Thus concludes all of the observations and experimental comparisons we'll explore in this video. Take a moment to review how the glaciers behaved and moved. Also reflect upon the ways that the surface texture, slope angle, and lubricant affected the glacier's behaviors. At this point, let's begin modeling the behaviors of glaciers. This means that we'll critically analyze what we observed and discuss what it means in terms of glacier behavior. We'll also consider the effects of accumulating and melting ice in glaciers, and how these processes influence them on a large scale. Now, glaciology can get very complex, and we don't want to forget what we're trying to do, so let's recall the goal for this video. 
After watching this video, you should be able to describe the structure and behaviors of an alpine glacier. Let's address this goal in finer detail. While you watched the glaciers move down their glacial valleys, you should have noticed a few key features and behaviors. One is that glaciers have a front end. This is called the glacier's terminus. It's the active, foremost end of the glacier. You might have also noticed that the medial portion of the glacier flowed faster than the sides did. As a result, the sharpie lines on some of the trials sort of warped and bent. This happens because the sides of the glacier are dragged back by friction against the walls of the valley, so they're slowed down. The force of friction can be illustrated here with these red arrows. The same thing happens at the bottom of the glacier, at the interface between the glacier ice and the substrate. There's more friction here. As a result, the top ice of the glacier flows quickly, while the bottom ice drags quite a bit slower. We can visualize this. Imagine drilling a borehole straight through the glacier all the way to the bottom. Imagine watching it over a long period of time. Its upper end would move forward quickly while its deeper end would get dragged back. All these combinations of shear forces result in tears in the ice. These tears are called crevasses. Let's now analyze how our experimental conditions affected the behaviors of the glacier. In our first experiment, we explored the effect of using a rougher substrate. The more rough the substrate is, the more friction acts against the bottom of the glacier. This explains why the glacier flowing over the rough surface flowed slower than the glacier on the control surface. The next experiment investigated the effect of changing the slope angle of the glacial valley. The pipe on the right has a steeper slope. Just like a ball rolling down a ramp, the glacier's speed is influenced by how steep the slope is. If the slope is steeper, the object ought to move faster. And we did, in fact, observe that on the steeper slope, the glacier moved significantly faster than the one on the more shallow slope. This makes sense but it also means that different parts of the same glacier may move at different speeds. It's possible that the rear end of a glacier, high up in the steep mountains, may actually be moving at a different speed than the ice at the glacier's terminus, where the slope is often shallower. Our last experiment looked at what lubricant does to the flow of a glacier. Now the only lubricant you're likely to find under a glacier is water. Water results naturally enough from melting, so sometimes the meltwater from a glacier will speed up the glacier's flow by reducing the friction between the glacier and the substrate. And we did in fact observe that adding lubricant increased the speed of the glacier. Glacial meltwater can even carve out long, twisty caves inside the glacier. If you explore a glacier, you might find whole rivers of meltwater flowing inside. The last aspects of glacier behavior we should consider are actually not observable in our flubber models, so we'll have to make some inferences based upon what we know about ice. The glacier is flowing downhill because snow accumulates up in the mountains. Near the terminus, the glacier is melting. A glacier whose terminus moves forward is said to be advancing, in this case, snow accumulation occurs faster than the ice can melt. A glacier whose terminus moves backward is said to be retreating. In this case, ablation, or melting, occurs faster than snow accumulation. An important point to make here is that even as the glacier retreats, it's still flowing forward. No glacier's material ever flows uphill. So a retreating glacier is not moving backward. The ice at its terminus is just melting a little faster than it can be replaced.
Finally, let's consider how different parts of the glacier are affected by different rates of snow accumulation and melting. Alpine glaciers begin up in the high, cold, steep mountains where the snow accumulates. In this area, the snow accumulates faster than it ablates, or melts. This area is called the zone of accumulation. We can spot the zone of accumulation in aerial views because it appears pure and white. We find relatively fresh snow here. But if we move farther down the mountain to lower elevations, the atmosphere gets warmer and the glacier ice melts at a faster rate. Eventually we reach a point where the glacier ice ablates, or melts, faster than it accumulates. This area is called the zone of ablation. In aerial views, this zone usually has a gray or brown tint, because the glacier's dark sediments are exposed as the ice melts away. Ice in the zone of ablation is older and looks kind of dirty. The line that lies right between the zone of accumulation and the zone of ablation is called the equilibrium point, or sometimes the snow line. And the equilibrium point can move with time. What if the snowfall increased? Take a moment to pause the video and consider this question. What will the equilibrium point do if snowfall increased? Would it move up the mountain, down the mountain, or stay put? If snowfall increased, the equilibrium point would move downhill. That's because the increased snowfall provides more snow. This expands the zone of accumulation, and so the equilibrium point moves forward. In this situation, the glacier usually advances. What do you think will happen if the average air temperature increased? Pause the video once more and consider this question. What will the equilibrium point do if the temperature increases. If the temperature were to increase, the equilibrium point would move uphill. This is because the zone of ablation expands and melts the glacier more quickly. In this situation, the glacier is likely to retreat. And if the equilibrium point backs far enough up the mountain due to a warming climate or reduced snowfall, the glacier can reach the point where the whole thing is contained within the zone of ablation. This is very bad for the glacier, because unless there's at least a small zone of accumulation, the glacier will melt away and disappear entirely. Glaciers are melting all around the globe, and so the water they store is being lost. This is generally bad for communities who rely upon glaciers for drinking water. That's one of the reasons why it's important to try to reduce our carbon footprint. The less carbon dioxide we produce, the less the climate warms, and the better off glaciers are, as well as the communities that rely on them. One last time, let's review the goal of this video to make sure that you met it. After watching this video, you should be able to Describe the structure and behaviors of an alpine glacier. If you can't do that, go back and review any portions of the video that you didn't quite understand. Congratulations, you are now officially an expert glaciologist. <laughs> and until next time, remember, you can learn anything. <laughs>